Welcome to the Bunyip and Aotashli podcast. Welcome back to Bunyip and Aotashli, a speculative fiction podcast. If you like what I'm doing, please like, subscribe, or whatever your podcast aggregator allows you to do. Thank you very much. This week, I've got two stories for you. The second one is a Japanese folk tale about someone seeking eternal life. But the first one is more down to earth. It's called The Hole in a Bagel by Tashrak, Israel Joseph Zevin. When I was a little boy, my Rebbe, a learned man who was always tormenting me with Talmudical questions and with riddles, once asked me, what becomes of the hole in a bagel when one has eaten the bagel? This riddle, which seemed to me then very hard to solve, stuck in my head, and I puzzled over it day and night. I often bought a bagel, took a bite out of it, and immediately replaced the bitten out piece with my hand so that the hole should not escape. But when I had eaten up the bagel, the whole head somehow always disappeared, which used to annoy me very much. I went about preoccupied, thought it over at prayers and at lessons, till the Rebbe noticed that something was wrong with me. At home, too, they remarked that I had lost my appetite, that I ate nothing but bagel. Bagel for breakfast, bagel for dinner, bagel for supper, bagel all day long. They also observed that I ate it to the accompaniment of strange gestures and contortions of both my mouth and my hands. One day I summoned all my courage and asked the Rebbe, in the middle of a lesson on the Pentateuch, Rebbe, when one has eaten a bagel, what becomes of the hole? Why, you silly, answered the Rebbe, what is a hole in a bagel? Just nothing at all. A bit of emptiness. It's nothing with the bagel. It's nothing without the bagel. Many years have passed since then, I have not yet been able to satisfy myself as to what is the object of a hole in a bagel. I have considered whether one could not have bagels without holes. One lives and learns, and America has taught me this. One can have bagels without holes, for I saw them in a dairy shop in East Broadway. I at once recited the appropriate blessing, and then I asked the shopman about these bagels and heard a most interesting history which shows how difficult it is to get people to accept anything new and what sacrifices it costs to introduce the smallest reform. This is the story. A baker in an Illinois city took it into his head to make straight bagels in the shape of candles, but this reform cost him dear because the united owners of the bakeries in the city immediately made a set at him and boycotted him. They argued our father's fathers baked bagels with holes, The whole world eats bagels with holes, and here comes a bold coxcomb of a fellow, upsets the order of the universe, and bakes bagels without holes. Have you ever heard of such impertinence? It's just revolution. And if a person like this is allowed to go on, he will make an end of everything. Today it's bagels without holes. Tomorrow it will be the holes without bagels. Such a thing has never been known before. And because of the hole in a bagel, a storm broke out in that city that grew presently into a civil war. The bosses fought on and dragged the baker's hands union after them into the conflict. Now the union contained two parties, of which one declared that a hole and a bagel constituted together a private affair, like religion, and that everyone had a right to bake bagels as he thought best, and according to his conscience. The other party maintained that to sell bagels without holes was against the Constitution to which the first party replied that the Constitution should be altered, as being too ancient and contrary to the spirit of the times. At this, the second party raised a clamor, crying that the rules could not be altered because they were Torah's lakshan, and every letter, every stroke, every dot was a law in itself. The city papers were obliged to publish daily accounts of the meetings that were held to discuss the hole in a bagel, and the papers also took sides and wrote fiery polemical articles on the subject. The quarrel spread through the city until all the inhabitants were divided into two parties, the bagel with a whole party and the bagel without a whole party. 
children rose against their parents, wives against their husbands, engaged couples severed their ties, families were broken up, and still the battle raged, and all on account of the hole in the bagel. I guess that goes for donuts as well. The second story here is a Japanese fairy tale retold. And it's called The Story of the Man Who Did Not Wish to Die. Long, long ago, there lived a man called Sentaro. His surname meant millionaire, but although he was not so rich as all that, he was still very far removed from being poor. He had inherited a small fortune from his father and lived on this, spending his time carelessly without any serious thoughts of work till he was about 32 years of age. One day, without any reason whatsoever, the thought of death and sickness came to him. The idea of falling ill or dying made him very wretched. I should like to live, he said, till I am five or six hundred years old at least, free from all sickness. The ordinary span of a man's life is very short. He wondered whether it were possible, by living simply and frugally henceforth, to prolong his life as long as he wished. He knew there were many stories in ancient history of emperors who had lived a thousand years, and there was a princess of Yamato who, it was said, lived to the age of five hundred. This was the latest story of a very long life record. Sentaro had often heard the tale of the Chinese king named Shin no Shiko. He was one of the most able and powerful rulers in Chinese history. He built all the large palaces and also the famous Great Wall of China. He had everything in the world he could wish for, but in spite of all his happiness and the luxury and the splendor of his court, the wisdom of his counselors and the glory of his reign, he was miserable because he knew that one day he must die and leave it all. When Shin no Shiko went to bed at night, when he rose in the morning, as he went through his day, the thought of death was always with him. He could not get away with it. Ah, if only he could find the elixir of life, he would be happy. The emperor at last called a meeting of his courtiers and asked them all if they could not find for him the elixir of life, of which he had so often read and heard. One old courtier Jofuku, by name, said that far away across the seas there was a country called Horizon, and that certain hermits lived there who possessed the secret of the elixir of life. Whoever drank of this wonderful draught lived forever. The emperor ordered Jofuku to set out for the land of Horizon, to find the hermit and to bring him back a vial of the magic elixir. He gave Jofuku one of his best junks, fitted it out for him, and loaded it with great quantities of treasures and precious stones for Jofuku to take as presents to the hermits. Jofuku sailed for the land of Horizon, but he never returned to the waiting emperor. But ever since that time, Mount Fuji has been said to be the fabled Horizon and of hermits who had the secret of the elixir, and Jofuku has been worshipped as their patron god. Now Sentaro determined to set out to find the hermits and if he could, to become one, so that he might obtain the water of perpetual life. He remembered that as a child he had been told that not only did these hermits live on Mount Fuji, but that they were said to inhabit all the very high peaks. So he left his home to the care of his relatives and started out on his quest. He traveled through all the mountainous regions of the land, climbing to the tops of the highest peaks, but never a hermit did he find. At last, after wandering in an unknown region for many days, he met a hunter. Can you tell me, asked Sentaro, where the hermits live who have the elixir of life? No, said the hunter, I can't tell you where such hermit live, but there is a notorious robber living in these parts. It is said that he is chief of a band of two hundred followers. This odd answer irritated Sentaro very much, and he thought how foolish it was to waste more time in looking for the hermits this way. So he decided to go at once to the shrine of Jofuku, who is worshipped as the patron god of the hermits in the south of Japan. Sentara reached the shrine and prayed for seven days, entreating Jofuku to show him the way to a hermit who could give him what he wanted so much to find. At midnight of the seventh day, as Sentara knelt in the temple, the door of the innermost shrine flew open, and Jofuku appeared in a luminous cloud, and calling to Sentara to come nearer, 
spoke thus. Your desire is a very selfish one and cannot be easily granted. You think that you would like to become a hermit so as to find the elixir of life. Do you know how hard a hermit's life is? A hermit is only allowed to eat fruit and berries and the bark of pine trees. A hermit must cut himself off from the world so that his heart may become as pure as gold and free from every earthly desire. Gradually, after following these strict rules, the hermit ceases to feel hunger or cold or heat, and his body becomes so light that he can ride on a crane or a carp and can walk on water without getting his feet wet. You, Centaro, are fond of good living and of every comfort. You are not even like an ordinary man, for you are exceptionally idle and more sensitive to heat and cold than most people. You would never be able to go barefoot or to wear only one thin dress in the winter time. Do you think that you would ever have the patience or the endurance to live a hermit's life? In answer to your prayer, however, I will help you in another way. I will send you to the country of perpetual life, where death never comes, where the people live forever. Saying this, Jofugu put into Sentaro's hand a little crane made of paper, telling him to sit on its back, and it would carry him there. Sentaro obeyed wonderingly. The crane grew large enough for him to ride on with comfort. It then spread its wings, rose high in the air, and flew away over the mountains right out to sea. Sentaro was at first quite frightened, but by degrees he grew accustomed to the swift flight through the air. On and on they went for thousands of miles. The bird never stopped for rest or food, but as it was a paper bird, it doubtless did not require any nourishment, and, strange to say, neither did Sentaro. After several days they reached an island. The crane flew some distance inland and then alighted. As soon as Sentaro got down from the bird's back, the crane folded up of its own accord and flew into his pocket. Now Sentaro began to look about him wonderingly, curious to see what the country of perpetual life was like. He walked first round about the country, and then through the town. Everything was, of course, quite strange and different from his own land, but both the land and the people seemed prosperous, so he decided that it would be good for him to stay there and took up lodgings at one of the hotels. The proprietor was a kind man, and when Sentaro told him that he was a stranger and had come to live there, he promised to arrange everything that was necessary with the governor of the city concerning Sentaro's sojourn there. He even found a house for his guest, and in this way Sentaro obtained his great wish and became a resident in the country of perpetual life. Within the memory of all the islanders, no man had ever died there, and sickness was a thing unknown. Priests had come over from India and China and told them of a beautiful country called Paradise, where happiness and bliss and contentment fill all men's hearts. But its gates could only be reached by dying. This tradition was handed down for ages from generation to generation, but none knew exactly what death was, except that it led to paradise. Quite unlike Sentaro and other ordinary people, instead of having a great dread of death, they all, both rich and poor, longed for it as something good and desirable. They were all tired of their long, long lives, and longed to go to the happy land of contentment called Paradise, of which the priests had told them centuries ago. All this Sentaro soon found out by talking to the islanders. He found himself, according to his ideas, in the land of topsy turvydom Everything was upside down. He had wished to escape from dying. He had come to the land of perpetual life with great relief and joy, only to find that the inhabitants themselves, doomed to never to die, would consider it bliss to find death. We had hitherto considered poison these people ate as good food. With all the things to which he had been accustomed as food, they rejected. Whenever any merchants from other countries arrived, their rich people rushed to them eager to buy poisons. These they swallowed eagerly, hoping for death to come, so that they might go to paradise. But what were deadly poisons in other lands were without effect in this strange place, and people who swallowed them with the hope of dying only found that in a short time they felt better in health instead of worse. Vainly, they tried to imagine what depth could be like. 
The wealthy would have given all their money and all their goods if they could but shorten their lives to two or three hundred years even. Without any change to live on forever seemed to this people wearisome and sad. In the chemist shops there was a drug which was in constant demand, because after using it for a hundred years it was supposed to turn the hair slightly gray and to bring about disorders of the stomach. Centara was astonished to find that the poisonous globe fish was served up in restaurants as a delectable dish, and hawkers in the streets went about selling sauces made of Spanish flies. He never saw anyone ill after eating these horrible things, nor did he ever see anyone with as much as a cold. Centara was delighted. He said to himself that he would never grow tired of living, and that he considered it profane to wish for death. He was the only happy man on the island. For his part, he wished to live thousands of years and to enjoy life. He set himself up in business, and for the present, never even dreamed of going back to his native land. As years went by, however, things did not go as smoothly as at first. He had heavy losses in business, and several times some affairs went wrong with his neighbors. This caused him great annoyance. Time passed like the flight of an arrow for him, for he was busy from morning till night. Three hundred years went by in this monotonous way, and then, at last, he began to grow tired of life in this country, and he longed to see his own land and his old home. However long he lived there, life would always be the same, so was it not foolish and wearisome to stay on here forever? Sentaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recollected Jofuku, who had helped him before when he was wishing to escape from death, and he prayed to the saint to bring him back to his own land again. No sooner did he pray than the paper crane popped out of his pocket. Sentaro was amazed to see that it had remained undamaged after all these years. Once more the bird grew and grew until it was large enough for him to mount it. As he did so, the bird spread its wings and flew swiftly out across the sea in the direction of Japan. Such was the willfulness of the man's nature that he looked back and regretted all he had left behind. He tried to stop the bird in vain. The crane held on its way for thousands of miles across the ocean. Then a storm came on and the wonderful paper crane got damp, crumbled up and fell into the sea. Centaro fell with it. Very much frightened at the thought of being drowned, he cried out loudly to Jofuku to save him. He looked around, but there was no ship in sight. He swallowed a quantity of seawater, which only increased his miserable plight. While he was thus struggling to keep himself afloat, he saw a monstrous shark swimming towards him. As it came nearer, it opened its huge mouth, ready to devour him. Centaro was all but paralyzed with fear now that he felt his end so near, and screamed out as loudly as ever he could to Jofuku to come and rescue him. Lo and behold, Santara was awakened by his own screams to find that during his long prayer he had fallen asleep before the shrine, and that all his extraordinary and frightful adventures had been only a wild dream. He was in a cold perspiration with fright and utterly bewildered. Suddenly a bright light came towards him, and in the light stood a messenger. The messenger held a book in his hand and spoke to Sentaro. I am sent to you by Jofuku, who in answer to your prayer has permitted you in a dream to see the land of perpetual life. But you grew weary of living there and begged to be allowed to return to your native land so you might die. Jofuku, so that he might try you, allowed you to drop into the sea and then sent a shark to swallow you up. Your desire for death was not real, for even at that moment you cried out loudly and shouted for help. It is also vain for you to wish to become a hermit, or to find the elixir of life. These things are not for such as you. Your life is not austere enough. It is best for you to go back to your paternal home and to live a good and industrious life. Never neglect to keep the anniversaries of your ancestors, and make it your duty to provide for your children's future. Thus will you live to a good old age and be happy, but give up the vain desire to escape death, for no man can do that. And by this time you have surely found out that even when selfish desires are granted, they do not bring happiness. In this book I give you, there are many precepts good for you to know. If you study them, you will be guided in the way I have pointed out to you. The angel disappeared as soon as he had finished speaking, and Sentaro took the lesson to heart. 
With a book in his hand, he returned to his old home, and giving up all his old vain wishes, tried to live a good and useful life, and to observe the lessons taught him in the book. And he and his house prospered henceforth. A Japanese Fairy Tale as Retold by Ye Orizaki And I hope you prosper and live a long, long life. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to like and subscribe if you got them. I appreciate your listening. Thank you very much. This has been the Bunyip and Ayutashli Speculative Fiction Podcast. Bye.